When I was in my 20s, I spent five years living in my ancestral homeland of India. I wanted to deepen my spiritual practice. On September 13, 2008, my adopted city of Delhi was a site of five synchronized bomb blasts that took place just minutes apart at various locations throughout the city. These blasts were fueled by fundamentalism. They killed 20 and injured more than 90. And they put my nervous system in high alert. And every day, fear coursed through my body. It was against this backdrop that I heard a visiting peace activist was coming to speak on the anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi's birth. And my intuition told me I just had to attend this talk. That experience changed my life forever. The speaker was Thich Nhat Hanh, who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And that evening, he introduced a term that is foundational to the beloved community, Dr. King Envision, interbeing. To describe interbeing, he held up a piece of paper and said, if you look deeply, you'd see there is a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. Without the cloud, there'd be no rain. Without the rain, the trees cannot grow. And without the trees, we cannot make paper. He went on to say, if you look deeply enough, you could even see the logger who cut down the trees and the logger's ancestors in this sheet of paper. His reflection on all that exists in a sheet of paper was a watershed moment. And for the first time in my life, I had a sense of the interdependent nature of reality. And so I left that evening with a challenge. How could I live my life in a way that deepens my understanding and experience of interbeing? Four years later, I was on retreat at a monastery, New Year's Eve, and this intention came to me. My deepest aspiration is to grow my heart as wide as the world, cultivate boundless love, and release all that is not love and generosity from my heart. And even now, as I read this, it is so clear that that was the moment when this big concept of interbeing had real meaning for my life. If interbeing was the what for my life, then this aspiration was the how. But then my next aha was that if I wanted to breathe life into this aspiration and truly live it, then I had to move in the world with tenderness. For me, tenderness is a heart-opening, expansive energy that melts a sense of separation from all life. It evokes warmth, and it also awakens me to vulnerability. And probably the best way to understand tenderness is to experience it. So I invite you all to take a gentle breath and bring to mind an image that softens you into a feeling of tenderness. It might be a child, an elder, a pet, even a scene from nature. Whatever it is, just touch into what you're feeling and where in your body you feel it. I feel it in my heart. It is soothing and I feel connected. There's a great longing in our world for a sense of belonging, to be fully seen and loved. And I believe this feeling we may have all just had a tender heart could be an answer to this yearning. For the past several years, I've been working as a leader in the field of emotional intelligence. And last year was honored to be recognized as one of 10 powerful women of the mindfulness movement. And throughout that time, I've been paying attention to tenderness. And here's what I found. Tenderness is often overlooked, even though it is profound. And when you search tenderness in scientific publications, almost all the references have to do with meat tenderizers or physical pain. But throughout history, 
across cultures and religions, tenderness, this feeling characterized by warmth and gentle care is seen as critical to cultivating a nurturing love. Parker Palmer wrote, there is no greater work for human hands than to hold a child with a fierce tenderness and say in a way words never can, you are loved, you are safe, you can trust. So embracing tenderness can be a pathway to cultivating the genuine relationships we all need to flourish. And the survival of the human species may very well depend on tenderness. Tenderness is also powerful to me because it helps me embrace paradoxical emotions and it allows me to hold space for the coexistence of what might seem contradictory. Happiness and sadness, love and fear, gentleness and strength. In fact, organizational scientists have found that individuals who welcome paradox demonstrate greater creativity and adaptability. And in a world that is only becoming more complex, creativity and adaptability are vital. And this is what I know to be true about tenderness. Tenderness is connected with empathy, compassion, and vulnerability. Empathy is feeling for and with others. Compassion is feeling for and with others, coupled with the motivation to relieve suffering. And vulnerability is the courage to fully open up to others. It's the birthplace of true connection. But tenderness can be a key ingredient that activates, deepens, and ignites these powerful emotions. And one of the reasons it can do that is because tenderness is embodied. And in a world where most of us are living in our head, tenderness resides in the heart. Experiencing tenderness in my body activates compassion and connection toward myself and others. And tenderness is reciprocal. There's a mutuality to it. It involves a relationship with oneself, another, or even nature. And it's not just about reaching out, but allowing oneself to be reached, to be vulnerable. Earlier this year, my son was rushed to the hospital and diagnosed with a rare disease. And sitting by his hospital bed for several days, I was more present than I'd been since he was a delicate newborn. The doors to my heart flung open, and tenderness poured out. And during this time in the hospital, I asked myself, why did it take such a drastic circumstance for me to come more fully home to my tender heart? And can I cultivate tenderness as a way of being? And what I've discovered is that if I can slow down enough throughout my day to intentionally touch into tenderness, it's a pathway back home to my true self, to each other, and our beloved Mother Earth. And here's what I've discovered about how to spark greater tenderness in our lives. Growing our tenderness capacity must begin with tending and befriending ourselves. The most powerful way I can hold myself with tenderness is to treat myself as I would treat someone who I care for deeply. Now we all know this is hard and it takes practice, for me, one of my best friends is from Texas. And so now when any unhelpful internal dialogue arises, I can literally hear her sweet Texan accent affirming me and comforting me. So whatever the situation, large or small, I've committed to treating myself as a dear, loving, wise friend would treat me. So first, tenderness towards oneself. My husband is Japanese and an artist and a great teacher to me of wabi-sabi, the Japanese art of appreciating the beauty of imperfection and impermanence. At our last home, we had a cherry blossom tree, probably the most exquisite embodiment of wabi-sabi. Cherry blossoms grace us with their magnificence for a fleeting period. 
and Hanami, the act of appreciating cherry blossoms involves intentionally gathering under their blooming trees, appreciating their beauty while also recognizing that their brilliance will soon fade. Wabi Sabi grows my tenderness because it puts me in touch with the fragility of all life and the delicate beauty that surrounds me. And especially when you touch nature in this way, you are moved to protect it. Now, when it comes to bringing tenderness into our relationships with others, there are two strategies that have been really helpful. The first is to turn towards. And turning towards comes from the Gottman's work on relationships. And it refers to acknowledging and responding to our partner's bids for connection. And bids are any attempt a partner makes verbally or non-verbally to connect with their partner. So I've inherited an intense work ethic from being the child of immigrants. And for as long as I can remember, have had incredible fortitude for getting things done. And when I'm in my get shit done productivity zone, it is as if I'm surrounded by an impenetrable force field of focus. And of course, it is precisely during these moments of intense concentration that my sweet husband will make a bid for connection. A gentle touch, a kiss on the cheek, a simple comment about the weather. And to be honest, I often respond with an internal scream, can't you see how busy I am? I'm trying to conquer my to-do list. But I'm learning to recognize the immense importance of meeting those bids for connection. And it's a good thing because in the Gottman's research, they followed couples through their first six years of marriage. And what they found is the one thing couples who stayed together had in common was that they met their partner's bids for connection 86% of the time or more. Now that's a lot of tenderness. So while I still love to get shit done, I love my husband more. And so I'm trying to change. And just as I touch into those delicate cherry blossoms, I'm recognizing the delicate nature of relationships. Without our conscious effort to tend and nurture them, they simply will not flourish. But here's the fascinating thing. Turning towards extends far beyond our romantic relationships. It holds true for all the connections we cherish, our bonds with friends, family, colleagues, even strangers. Each interaction is an opportunity to embrace tenderness, fostering a sense of belonging and deepening the bonds we share. Now, the next strategy is to be curious. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of my suffering comes from judging, judging myself and judging others. But true tenderness the kind that makes someone feel like they are fully seen cannot coexist with judgment, but curiosity can melt judgment. It's an antidote to judgment and it's the foundation for deep listening. And I love this quote from Mark Nepo that to listen is to lean in softly with the willingness to be changed by what you hear. Now, when you've cultivated tenderness towards yourself and others, you begin to develop a foundation for tender-hearted leadership. A few years ago, at the end of a year-long training I was facilitating, some of the participants gave me a beautiful card and shared that one of the things they admired most was my gentle, tender-hearted leadership. Now, at first, I didn't take this as a compliment. I thought, is this some microaggression because I'm an Asian woman? There's been times in my life where my stillness and soft voice have been interpreted as being meek. And it's caused me to question if I'm meant to be a leader, do I need to change my way of being? But then I thought to myself, wait a second, the leaders I admire most, Gandhi, Thich Nhat Hanh, and my mother are simultaneously powerful and tenderhearted. And make no mistake about it, you need both 
It takes courage to be tender. Not everyone values tenderness as an important leadership trait. To some, it signals weakness. But when we lead with tenderness, we give permission for others to show up in their fullness with all their vulnerability. And without vulnerability, we cannot cultivate authentic relationships. It's time to transcend notions of dominance and control toward a new understanding of powerful leadership, one that embraces attributes of tenderness, like warmth, collaboration, and interdependence. You see, I've come to realize that tenderness is not a weakness, but a superpower that guides me to lead in a way that fosters harmony. Picture a culture of tenderness where no one is left outside the circle of compassion, where there is a palpable sense of affection and where we truly cherish one another. The world can feel like a hard place Rumi, the great Sufi poet, said that our greatest strength lies in the gentleness and tenderness of the heart. That night in Delhi, it was so clear to me that to meet this moment, we are going to need a culture that is tender, where we stop forgetting that we belong to each other. We often hear people talk about empathy, compassion, love, or even interbeing. But let us not forget that a spark that can ignite those flames is tenderness. So as I close, I invite you to hold this question close to your heart. How can I live with greater tenderness toward myself, others, and the earth? Thank you.